Hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth lecture of the fourth module, which is on CMOS inverters. So far, we have been analyzing the static characteristics, the power dissipation components, I mean, even the dynamic characteristics of the CMOS inverters in seclusion. We have been looking at CMOS inverters when they're isolated. We are not looking, looking at the real picture where these CMOS inverters like, coexist with other logic gates, they are driving other logic gates or similar chain of inverters. So in this lecture, we would be analyzing what exactly is the real scenario on the ICs, where these CMOS inverters do not exist in isolation, but they are actually a part of a larger string or larger chain of logic gates. So the disclaimers remain the same. So let us discuss about this propagation delay from a different perspective. So we discussed in the lecture on you know, this dynamic characteristics that this load capacitance is actually composed of this C intrinsic, which is nothing but you know composed of the diffusion capacitance of these MOSFETs, as well as one component of this CGD, which is obtained here by Miller approximation. And we told that you know these diffusion capacitances, whenever we calculated either the bottom plate capacitance or the sidewall capacitance, we found out that all of these components are actually depending upon the width of the device. So they depend upon sizing. Now, one of the attempts which we'll do in this slide would be to relate this C in, which is nothing but you know, composed of diffusion capacitances as well as the gate to drain overlap capacitance and the CGD, basically the um, Miller approximation CGD, which appears at the output mode. So we'll be trying to relate this to the input gate capacitance of this CMOS inverter. So what is the input gate capacitance? It's basically CGS of both the MOSFETs plus the CGD would have another component here as well. So when you do Miller approximation, the CGD becomes twice CGD here because its gain is minus one and it becomes CGD by two here when you take it between input node and the ground. However, the magnitude of CGD is pretty low. So gate capacitance is typically taken as CGS of like some of the CGS of both these PMOS as well as NMOS and CGD is kind of ignored. So the first attempt would be to relate this intrinsic capacitance, which is appearing at the output node, to the input capacitance, input gate capacitance. Why we are doing, trying to find out a relationship between C and CG? Because this makes our life pretty easy. It gives you another way of looking at the propagation delay, and which can be extended to all the other logic gates. And you know, even with sizing and all, this kind of uh, like you know uh, the viewpoint that I'll be giving you in the further slides using this kind of relationship between C int and CG, uh, that will kind of give you a way to analyze all the other logic gates. So let me first tell you how exactly we do that. So if you look at the magnitude of C int and CG, the measured values for any advanced CMOS technology, you'll find out that C int is very close to CG. And you know, even uh, heuristically, we can see that you know C int is proportional to sizing. I mean, C int depends on this width of the PMOS and MOS, both CGD and diffusion capacitance depend on the width, as well as these input capacitance, CGS of both these MOSFETs, that also depends upon the width. So that is one link which we can you know use to kind of you know provide a relationship between C int and C. Since both of them are depending upon width, there can be a relation between the two. And empirically, I mean by looking at the measurement results, what people found is that you know this C int can be related to this CG, which is the input gate capacitance, as C int is equals to gamma of CG. Where gamma is a technology parameter, it's a technologically dependent, like it's dependent upon technology. And typically for these submicron technologies or the advanced CMOS technologies, this gamma is pretty close to one. So you know, uh, we were trying to find out relationship between C int and CG so that we can express the capacitance over here in terms of the input capacitance. That's the main goal. And we'll see how it simplifies our life. So we say now that you know C int is equals to gamma CG, both are proportional to sizing. That's a common link between the two. And gamma is a technology dependent parameter. Typically, it's close to one for these submicron technologies. Now let us talk about this CX. What was CX? So CX was coming because of you know the wiring capacitance, because of the interconnects, and also because of the CG of the subsequent stages, right? So we told that this inverter would be driving some other logic. So let us say that if this inverter is driving another inverter, then the load capacitance would be the input gate capacitance of the next inverter here, right? So this C external is nothing, but it consists of the wiring capacitance plus the CGS or the gate capacitance of the load, which it has to drive. 
plus a component of CGT after Miller approximation. So this component of CGT after Miller approximation, how it will come? Similarly, we saw that you know here this is CGT and CGT by two comes here if the gain is minus one. Here also some component of this output gate would come in the form of CGT, but since that is pretty small, so what we do is we neglect that. And we say that CX is nothing but CW plus CGS load. And CGS load kind of depends upon the fan outs, right? So let's say if this inverter is driving four other inverters. So the CX will be dominated by four times CG. Four times CG, basically four times the gate capacitance of all these four inverters. So CX can also be expressed as F into CG, where F is the fan out factor. How many gates this is this uh, inverter driving and what is the CG of all those gates? So it's just multiplication of F into CG. If it is driving identical gates, having input capacitance CG, then it's simply F times CG. If it is driving F number of those fan outs or F number of those gates. So CX is kind of dominated by this CGS load, which is kind of dependent upon the number of loads that it is driving and the CG value of each of those loads. So CW is typically pretty small and the CGD is also pretty small. So C external is basically dominated by the CGS load and that is or that is given by this F times CG. So you can assume like this is something which is approximation. I mean, it's not exact value, right? It is an approximation. Now with this kind of notation where we have related both C in and CX to this input gate capacitance of the inverter, we can relate the CL in to this CG. So what is CL? CL is C plus CX equals to gamma of CG plus F of CG. So it's gamma CG 1 plus F by gamma. So CL can be written as gamma CG 1 plus F by gamma. And what is gamma CG? Gamma CG is nothing but C. So it's all, it can also be written as C 1 plus CX by C or gamma CG 1 plus F by gamma. Now this makes our life pretty simple. How? We shall look at it. Now, how do we represent TPHL and TPLH? So TPHL is nothing but 0.6 times R equivalent N into CL by L because for high to low transition of output, we are kind of draining it through this N MOSFET, draining to the ground through this N MOSFET. For TPLH, it is 0.6 times R equivalent of T times CL. Why R equivalent of T? Because then we are charging this node capacitance with the help of this P MOS, right? So it's 0 0.6 times R equivalent of P times CL. Now we define something which is arithmetic mean of this R equivalent and, and R equivalent P. And we call that R equivalent of this inverter. So this R equivalent kind of represents the arithmetic mean of N MOSFET, equivalent resistance of N MOSFET and the equivalent resistance of P MOSFET. And this R equivalent is called the equivalent resistance of this inverter. Now, how can we define TP? So TP is nothing but the arithmetic mean of TPHL and TPLH, right? So it's 0 0.69 half R equivalent N plus R equivalent P and into CL, right? So here you can replace this term by R equivalent of the inverter and you can replace this CL by gamma CG 1 plus F by gamma. So this is nothing but, uh, you know, now you can uh, do another simplification. What you can do here I have represented is 0 0.69 R equivalent of the inverter multiplied by C in, right? This is C in and then 1 plus F by gamma. Now you can represent this term 0.69 R equivalent times gamma CG or C in as TP0. What is TP0? So TP0 is nothing but it's called intrinsic inverter delay. That is the delay of inverter when it is not loaded by any external capacitance, when it sees only the intrinsic capacitance at its load. So this TP0 is simply 0.69 R equivalent of the inverter multiplied by a C in of this inverter. And it's called intrinsic inverter delay that is the delay of the inverter when it is not when it is not driving any load when it is only driving its intrinsic capacitances and what are those capacitances it's the diffusion capacitances plus a component of cgd multiplied by the like what you get by the miller approximation so how you can relate tp like how can you uh, tell tp or represent tp in terms of tp0 so tp is nothing but tp0 1 plus cx by c right so this exactly is your TP0, this is TP0 and what is this? 1 plus, this is CX by C in, right? So it's nothing but TP can be represented in terms of TP0 as TP is equals to TP0, 1 plus F by gamma. So if the inverter is driving only its intrinsic capacitances, that is if it is in isolation, what you get is TP0 
And when you have to drive any other fan out, when you have to drive any other logic gates, then what happens? Your inter like your delay, propagation delay, that becomes Vp0, 1 plus f by gamma. Gamma is a technological parameter and f is the number of fan outs. So using this, and like using this expression, you can find out the delay when you know f, right? How many loads it is driving. So this becomes really helpful when we are looking at, you know, chain of inverters or when you are looking at inverters driving other inverters or other logic gates. Now, let us find out or let us try to understand what exactly is TP0 and what exactly is minimum sized inverter. So we know about minimum sized MOSFETs, right? For minimum sized MOSFETs, L equals to L min, W is equals to W of min. But what exactly is your minimum sized inverter? That is what we should try to understand now. So first, this TP0 was what? TP0 was simply 0.6 times R equivalent gamma CG, which is C, right? Now, this TP0 is what? It's 0.6 times half R equivalent N plus R equivalent P, gamma of CGN plus CGP. What is CGN? CGN is the gate capacitance of your NFET, N MOSFET, and CGP. CGP is your gate capacitance of P MOSFET. Now, why we are doing this exercise? Because ideally, we don't keep this P MOSFET for symmetric behavior and for achieving large noise margin or, you know, uh, I would say a large noise margin or for symmetric behavior or for, you know, even having uh, equal DPHL and DPLH for 50% duty cycle to be satisfied. What we typically take is, we typically take this beta to be 2, right? It's the ratio of mobility of the P or it's the ratio of kind of resistance of the NMOS to the PMOS or that turns out as the ratio of the mobilities of electrons to that of the hole and that is why we get beta equals to 2, right? So, we typically size this inverter to have beta width in the PMOS bit for having symmetric characteristics, large noise margin and equal TPLH and TPHL. So, for any MOSFET, if we have like you know, if you increase the width, your CG is proportional to width, right? Your CG is proportional to width as well as length because CG depends upon W into L C ox, right? So your CG of N as well as CG of P that depends upon the width. So what what can you say about the CG of this? Since it is sized beta times as compared to this one, so the CG of this will be beta times. So CG P would be beta times CG N from here. And also, R equivalent, we saw that it's proportional to 1 by W by L, right? It's proportional to 1 by I. And I is proportional to W by L. So, R equivalent is proportional to L by W. So, it's R equivalent of P would be scaled by factor beta, with which we have scaled its width, right? So, now let us say that CG0 and R equivalent 0 is the gate capacitance and the equivalent resistance of a minimum size MOSFET. So let's say that CG0 is the gate capacitance of this and R equivalent 0 is the equivalent resistance of this MOSFET, minimum size MOSFET, which is here. Now, if this P MOSFET is sized beta times as compared to that of N MOSFET, which is minimum sized, having an input gate capacitance CG0 and an equivalent resistance R equivalent of 0, what happens? The equivalent resistance of this P MOSFET becomes R equivalent of P divided by beta. Since R equivalent of N is always smaller as compared to R equivalent of P, why? Because of the difference in the mobility of electrons and holes. So once you reduce this R equivalent of P by beta, then even the equivalent resistance of this P MOSFET, which becomes R equivalent P by beta, becomes equals to R equivalent of zero, which is the equivalent resistance of N MOSFET, which is minimum sized. However, what happens to its gate capacitance? Since you're scaling the width by beta, its input gate capacitance increases by beta. So that becomes beta CG0. So if you look at the delay, the delay now becomes 0.69 R equivalent 0 because now the R equivalent of both of them is R equivalent of 0 since you have already sized this R equivalent of P mass by beta uh, divided by beta. And then it becomes gamma times CG0, which is C1 plus beta. Why 1 plus beta? Because for N MOSFET, it's CG0 itself, but for P MOSFET, it's beta CG0. Now, when are we say like when we are saying minimum sized inverter, if we want to scale up this inverter, I mean if we want to realize or size 
up this inverter, what we do? We size the width of both NMOS and PMOS, let's say by a factor of S. That is width are sized by S into beta for PMOS and S for NMOS. Then let us look at what happens. So if you are sizing up the width by a factor of S for both transistors, what can you say about CG? CG will increase by a factor of S, right? And what can you say about the equivalent resistance, R equivalent? Equivalent resistance will go down by a factor of S, right? So when you are sizing these both transistors, both MOSFETs by a factor S, what happens? Equivalent resistance decreases by a factor of S, since it's proportional to 1 by W, and intrinsic capacitance increases by a factor of S. So if you look at TP0 in that case, I mean, if you look at TP, TP in that case, basically, so even if you like increase them, even if you increase both by a factor S, then this will become R equivalent 0 by S, and this will become S CG0. So S and S get cancelled. So that can, what can we say? This TP0 is independent of sizing factor S. So even if we are increasing, you know, uh, both the width of the both of them by a factor S, then it doesn't play any role or it doesn't change this TP0. Now, let us take the case when we are driving a load and when the C external is also present. So in that case, TP is what? TP would be TP0, 1 plus CX by SC, right? Because now, so here we were neglecting this, uh, you know, uh, here we were neglecting CX, but if you look at the previous slide, how exactly we have defined this CL? CL is, if you take sealed out, then it's 1 plus CX by C, right? So basically it's uh, 0.69 R equivalent gamma CG, which is C in 1 plus CX by C in, right? So now if you put that expression here, so what happens? You're kind of doing R equivalent 0 by S, you are multiplying C in by S, right? So that will also go here. So if you pull out SC in, then it will be R equivalent by S into SC in multiplied by 1 plus CX by SC in. So now when an external capacitance is present, then the situation is different. If it was only intrinsic capacitance, increasing width of both by size factor of S doesn't change TPC or doesn't change TP basically. But here, if the external capacitance is present, then what is happening is this TP is TP0, 1 plus CX by SC in, because now C in has become S times. So if you increase the size of both, then what happens? The delay reduces. But as I have been telling every time, nothing comes for free. There's no free lunch in you know BLSI. So as you increase the size, area is also increasing, right? And cost is proportional to area risk of. So as such, you reduce or you reduce the delay by increasing the size, but at the same time, you get an area penalty. And why are you able to increase the delay? Uh, why are you able to reduce the delay by increasing size? Just because your load capacitance is dominated by C X. If it were dominated by C in, you would not have got any effect. Now, the point that I want to mention here is analyzing inverters in isolation is purely academic exercise. Whatever we had been doing is not the realistic scenario. Now in this lecture, we would be facing the reality. We would be looking at how exactly these inverters behave or how exactly these you know, delay expressions look like when we consider chain of inverters or different logic gates being driven by this inverter. On this note, let us first analyze minimum sized inverters in cascade. So we have this as minimum sized inverter, this is size beta, this is one. And then it is driving another minimum size inverter, this is beta, this is one. So let us look at what happens. So generally we take wider P MOSFET with beta equals to 2 for symmetric BTC and equal TPLH and TPHF. However, we saw that you know this large beta, although it improves TPLH, how it improves TPH, TPLH? Because it provides or it improves the current or the current driving property, or you know, it reduces the resistance of this. So it kind of enables. So this this I'm talking in the case when this is kind of you know the CL is kind of dominated not by C, but there's a CX which is also present. If it were dominated by C, then this large beta won't improve TPLH. Why? Because this 
C int will also increase by beta, and this will also decrease by beta. So effectively, the product will remain same, right? So this we are talking about a case when C x is there. That is, your C l is not dominated by C int. You have C int as well as C x, and C x is something which is dominating, or the extrinsic capacitance is something which is dominating. So in that case, what happens? A larger beta improves C p l h. How? Because it improves the current driving capability, and the load capacitance doesn't increase much. Because it is still dominated by C X and not by C N. Although C N is increasing, but C X is still dominating. Therefore, only the R equivalent reduces. C L kind of remains almost same because C N is not that dominating there, right? So that is how it improves T P L H, but it degrades T P H L. How it degrades T P H L? So C L is kind of increased because of increase in C N. Although that is that is not much increase, but still the parasitic capacitance has increased. C L has increased. However, the R equivalent of N remains the same, right? So TPLH is degraded by increasing the parasitic capacitance when we are improved, like when we are increasing the beta factor. So increasing beta improves TPLH but degrades TPLH. So there should be some value of beta. Let us call that sizing factor alpha, which is the optimal value for which the delay is minimum. So let us find out that alpha, which is the scaling factor. now we are saying that we are not changing it or we are not sizing it as beta equals to 2 but what we are doing we are sizing it as alpha and alpha here and then we are trying to find out the value of alpha for which the delay of this system is smallest remember that beta equals to 2 when you size it like that you will achieve symmetric btc and equal tphl and tplh but here we are not interested in symmetric behavior we are just trying to find out for what value of alpha scaling factor alpha will get minimum propagation delay through this system so let us look at cl first so what are the different components of cl so cl component first is this cdb1 it is cdb2 then we have the c wire then we have the cgs of 4 cgs of 3 and then the cgd after doing miller approximation it will be 2 times cgd of 1 Plus CGD of two, which will come here, and also we have this CGD, right, of the second stage. So this CGD, when it, you break down and bring it here, it becomes 0.5 CGD, right? So you have at this node, what are the different components of CL? You have diffusion capacitances CDB one, CDB two. You have two times CGD of one plus two. Then you have CW, which is the wiring capacitance. Then you have CGS four, CGS three, and you have also got CGD. One component here through Miller through Miller approximation that is 0.5 CGD3 plus CGD4. However, note that these CGD3, CGD4, CGD1, CGD2, and CW they are negligible as compared to CDBs and CGS. So typically, what we do is we approximate CL as sum of CDB1 plus CDB2 and CGS4 plus CGS3. We neglect these terms as compared to these four. Terms. Now, when we are scaling it by alpha and this also by alpha, what we can say about CDB2? So CDB2 is nothing but alpha times CDB1, considering this as the minimum sized MOSFET. And CGS4 is what? It's alpha times CGS3, considering this as the minimum sized MOSFET. So now CL is approximated as one plus alpha CDB1 plus CGS3 plus CW. Let us, for the time being, consider that CW is appreciable. That is, you know. These two are connected by a long interval. That is an assumption. We'll take the case. We'll also see what happens when CW is also neglected. But for the time being, let us take the case when CW is appreciable and CGDs are neglected, and the CL is one plus alpha CDB one plus CGS three. Now, what about TP? TP is simply point six nine. This CL into point five R equivalent of one plus R equivalent of two by alpha, right? So this is R equivalent of one. This is R equivalent of two by alpha. Now, TP is simply 0.35, 0.345 because 0.5 into 0.69. One plus alpha CDP one plus CGS three plus CW. R equivalent of n. If you take it outside, it's one plus beta by alpha. So what is beta? Beta is R equivalent two by R equivalent of one. That is, it's the resistance ratio of equal sized n and p MOSFETs, right? Now, what exactly is beta? Since it's the ratio of the resistance of the n MOSFET and p MOSFET, 
it is actually proportional to inverse of the current right so it's basically ratio of currents and then uh, sorry ratio of inverse of currents and then it becomes like 2 so beta is actually 2 which is resistance ratio equal sized n mosfet and p mosfet now for optimal alpha what we want dtp by d alpha would be zero right after taking the derivative what we obtain is alpha optimal for which this dp is minimum that comes out as root beta 1 plus cw by cdp 1 plus cgs now the case we are we were talking was that you know cw was large but now if the cw is pretty small as compared to the intrinsic capacitance cdp 1 plus cgs of 3 that is this capacitance which is typically the case for real mosfets or real inverters then what happens alpha optimal goes as root of beta and not beta so alpha optimal is close to root 2 so if you size it by root 2 then you are going to get the lowest degree and not as 2 so the takeaway message is if you have smaller width of this p mosfet you have faster inverters however what is the trade off so you won't get symmetric behavior as well as equal noise margins or large noise margins and equal values of pph and pph now this was considering you know inverters driving another inverter let us take another case where you know we have an inverter chain we have an inverter chain there are n inverters and they are driving a load capacitor cl here the assumption or the kind of constraint we have is each inverter can be sized differently so you can have inverter size so let's say that uh, the first inverter is a minimum size inverter so that our cg1 which is the input gate capacitance of this inverter is minimum sized and you can size all these inverters according to your own whims what we have to do we have to drive this capacitor cl and we are applying input here and the task at hand is to calculate the propagation delay of this inverter chain and then find out the values of sizing parameter as well as the number of stages that is how many inverter stages are required so that this propagation delay is a minimum that is the problem at hand now what are the constraints so constraints first the first inverter is minimum sized that is its p mosfet is beta and mosfet is 1 and the cg1 is minimum sized cg1 corresponds to minimum sized inverter and other constraint each inverter can be sized differently so you can have you know s1 you can size 2 with s2 3 with s3 what does what that means you can increase width of both p mos and n mos in this 3 or 2 or n by whatever factor you want you can have independent sizing of all of these different inverter stages cl is a load capacitor right now cgj we are representing cgj as the total input gate capacitance of the jth inverter so let's say we have jth inverter here so we are representing its input capacitance as cg of j now cg1 since it's the input capacitance of the minimum size inverter it is 1 plus beta times cg0 if cg0 is the gate capacitance of minimum size inverter right minimum size mosfet See, CG1 is the input gate capacitance of minimum sized inverter. CG0 is the minimum capacitance of minimum sized MOSFET. They are related by this factor 1 plus beta. If P MOSFET is side scaled by beta and N MOSFET is minimum size. Always remember this definition. CG1 is input gate capacitance of inverter. CG0 is gate capacitance of MOSFET, minimum sized MOSFET. So that's the difference. Always remember that. And what is CL? CL is nothing but it can be represented as CG of n plus 1. That is, let's say we have another inverter here, which is n plus 1 stage, and then CL is kind of its input gate capacitance of that inverter. Now, how can we find out TPJ? That is the propagation delay of this JH stage, inverter at the JH stage. So, TPJ is simply TP0, 1 plus CGJ plus 1 divided by gamma of CGJ. So, this is simply TP0 1 plus CX by C in. So TP0 represents 0.69 R equivalent of inverter into C in, right? So it's TP0 1 plus CX by C in. What would be CX? So let's take the case of this second inverter, second stage. Let's say J is equals to 2. So what is its fan out? So its fan out is the input gate capacitance of inverter 3. So that is CJ of J plus 1, that is 3. And what is its input capacitance or what is its 
intrinsic capacitance so its intrinsic capacitance here is gamma times cg what is its cg it's like what is its cg cg is cg of 2 similarly for the jth stage your tp of j that is propagated propagation delay of the jth stage inverter would be tp0 1 plus cg j plus 1 divided by gamma times cg of j see how easy it has become to represent you know its delay that is equals to tp0 1 plus fj by gamma what is fj fj is the fan out of the jth stage here what would be f2 f2 will be simply cj3 divided by cj of 2 so that would be f of 2 that is the fan out of second inverter similarly fan out of the jth stage is tp0 1 plus fj by gamma now what exactly is the propagation delay of this entire chain of inverters it's simply summation of this with j going from 1 to n right so it's deep summation of tpj j going from 1 to n so if you pull this out it's simply tp0 summation over j equals to 1 to n 1 plus cgj plus 1 divided by gamma of cgj right now this is the propagation delay through this chain of inverters what are the unknowns unknowns are cgjs right cg1 we know that it's corresponding to minimum size inverter cg n plus 1 we know that it's corresponding to cl but all these intermediate values of cg that is something which we can size differently and then we can actually uh, design it or we can choose it according to our own wills or according to our wish in order to reduce this tp of the entire chain of inverters so what are the design variables first it's the value of cgj for each of these stages between j equals to 2 to n as well as the number of stages how many stages do we want to take let us say that n is fixed we have fixed the number of stages so if we have fixed the number of stages let us find out the condition for minimum tp so how do we do that so for a given n if we want to find out the condition for minimum propagation delay through this chain of inverter we just differentiate that tpj with respect to these unknowns cgjs since n is something that we know now i mean we have been provided n as a spec spec so what we do we take partial derivative of this propagation delay with all this cgj and then put it to zero if you do that you'll find out that you know you'll come up with this expression that is cgj by cgj plus 1 divided by cgj is equal to cgj divided by cgj minus 1 and if you represent this by f then you can see that cgj can be represented as the geometric mean of cgj minus 1 and cgj plus 1 what this means so the input gate capacitance of the jth stage inverter should be the geometric mean of the input gate capacitance of cg j minus 1 that is j minus 1 at stage and the input gate capacitance of j plus 1 at stage and another another thing that we conclude here is that you know j cg j plus 1 by cg j is equals to cg j by cg j minus 1 so if we take this example of second stage then what this means is this cg3 by cg2 is same as cg2 by cg1 so fan out of each stage is same what is the fan out of first stage it's cg2 divided by cg1 let's call that f what is fan out of second stage it's cg3 by cg2 and we find here that cg3 by cg2 is equals to cg2 by cg1 equals to f so fan out of each of these inverter state remains same and each of these inverter states is sized by same factor f y because it's cg like cg of 3 is f times cg of 2 right cg of 3 is f times cg of 2 so this inverter is sized f times as compared to 2 that is one point which we come to and second each stage has the same fan out that is f and if each stage has the same fan out, what is the delay of each stage? It's tp0 1 plus f by gamma. So if it's each stage has fj equals to f, each stage has same delay. So the delay provided by each stage is same. And like what, when it is same, when you have minimum delay, when you have a given n, then you have to make sure that your CGs are, you know, uh, arranged like this, or your CGs are or your MOSFETs or your inverters are scaled such that your CGs obey this rule and you have each stage of inverter scaled with 
with respect to the previous stage of the inverter by a same factor that is f and the fan out for each stage is also same which is f and hence the delay is same so these are few you know conclusions that we draw right away for obtaining minimum delay through this chain of inverter given number of stages n so what exactly is the take away message first we have to size the inverters such that you know the factor of sizing if we are sizing it this by one since it's minimum size this is sized by f then this should be sized by f square because f square by f is f right and we have to maintain that scaling law now that we know the condition for obtaining you know minimum delay through the chain of inverters let us find out what exactly is the value of that optimal delay optimal propagation delay and what exactly is the number of stages i mean what is the exactly optimal number of stages so let us first talk about this f which represents overall effective fan out so this capital f over here simply represents overall effective fan out so for that inverter chain under consideration cl was the load capacitance that was being driven and cg1 which is the input gate capacitance of the minimum size inverter that was the input gate capacitance of the first stage so effectively for the overall you know chain this capital f represents the overall effective fan out which is nothing but cl by cg1 that is cg n plus 1 divided by cg1 and now how can we represent this capital f in terms of small f which is fan out of the individual you know stages so the cl by cg1 i mean if you represent cl by cg1 it can be represented as cl divided by cg of n into cg of n divided by cg n plus 1 dot dot dot, dot cg2 by cg1 so this capital f is nothing but f into f into f how many times n times so this f raised for n is capital f so this fan out is simply nth root of cl by cg1 or nth root of this capital f which represents overall effective fan out now what is tp tp is tp0 summation j equals to 1 to n 1 plus this fan out i mean cx by gamma c cx is simply cg j plus 1 and what is seen seen is cgj so this is 1 plus cgj plus 1 by cgj this is your f 1 plus f by gamma small f by gamma basically fan out of each stage so what is tp min tp min is nothing but ntp0 so this becomes ntp0 so it's ntp0 1 plus nth root of f which is f small f the fan out of individual stages divided by gamma so this is the value of minimum propagation delay or tp optimal which we obtain when you have like when people have already given you a value for n right when people have given you a value for n now that we found found out this minimum propagation delay let us find out the optimal number of stages okay so let us look at this expression for minimum propagation delay if we have large n so if n is large then this term is small right so the first term is dominant so in that case if n is large the first term dominates and tp min is n tp0 if n is small then what happens this term doesn't dominate this is large and since nth root of capital f is small f so even the fan out of individual stages is large or the sizing factor for the individual stage that is also large right so if we have small f fan out is large for each stage and also the sizing factor for individual stage is large and the second term kind of dominates this tp min so that is the impact of your number of stages now how do we determine optimal n you just do this del tp min divided by del, like you just take the derivative with respect to n and equate it to zero once you do that the equation that comes is n gamma plus n times fan out or n times you know a sizing factor of individual stages equals to n times fan out ln of f log base e f or equivalently you end up obtaining this fan out factor is equals to e raised to power 1 plus gamma by f so this is something which is transcendental equation so its closed form solution is possible only when gamma is zero so when is gamma zero when we are neglecting this self loading that is c int is zero right so in that case you can obtain closed form solution and what is that solution 
in that case f is simply e and what is the optimal number of stages it is ln of f capital f that is effective overall fan so for practical cases what we have we have gamma not equals to 0 right and in that case this equation is not solvable as in closed form solution is not possible we'll have to use numerical simulations for finding out the value of f typically as we told previously that the value of gamma is close to 1 and for that case effective fan outs per stage comes out as 3.6 or the effective scaling factor per stage comes out as 3.6 what we do is in general we typically choose f between 3 and 4 and then we determine n that is the number of stages as ln of f divided by ln of f small f that is the fan out now some conclusions so even if you choose a fan out which is higher than the optimal that is higher than 3.6 then it does not affect delay much tp min doesn't change much so by increasing f higher than this 3.6 for gamma equals to 1 what you can do is you can reduce the area and reduce the value of n however if you use large n if you go for design where f is less than f optimal that is 3.6 how you calculate f optimal so for f optimal what you do you just differentiate this tp i mean you just differentiate this uh, tp with respect to df so this is not tp min which you are differentiating this is tp initial tp this thing if you differentiate this with respect to df then you get f optimal and that comes out as 3.6 itself for gamma equals to 1 so if you are going ahead with a design where you are kind of using sizing factors less than f optimal then you are kind of increasing the number of stages so for that if you look at tp the tp min then for that tp min actually increases so typically what we do is even for 3.6 we go ahead with a fan out factor of 4 and then we decide m that is number of stages and this sizing analysis was done for you know finding out the optimal value of delay you can also extend this analysis and do a uh, like you know uh, and size chain of inverters for optimal power as well as optimal energy now one thing which also affects delay and which we did not discuss in that dynamic behavior lecture was the impact of you know finite rise and fall time on the delay we discussed this in energy that is in static power dissipation like in the power dissipation that is you know it leads to a short circuit power dissipation However, it also leads to an increase in the delay. How? Let us look at that. So here, this plot simply shows you variation in the propagation delay of an inverter as a function of Ts, which is the transition time of the inputs. So during transition, what happens for some portion of the transition when you have finite rise and fall times, both the MOSFET and MOSFET conduct, and what happens? The charging or the discharging rate is then affected because both of them are counteracting. They're kind of reducing each other's influence on CL and as such load capacitor is not able to perfectly charge or discharge but there is a competition between the two and as such effective charging or discharging is kind of not that efficient when both are turned on. So when both are turned on when there is that short circuit then it reduces the effective charging and discharging currents to which the load capacitor is being charged or discharged and as such it increases the delay and if you look at this relationship when you are transition time of the input ts is larger than tp that is in this regime you see that the delay increases with increasing slope of the input so your tp increases your delay also increases so this is something which is dangerous right because in all the circuits you will have finite rise and fall times why rise times and fall times are finite because of the limited driving capability of the preceding gates right they are not able to charge or discharge this output capacitor instantaneously in a step way so all the circuits will have finite rise and fall times what you can do to improve it you can include those regenerative buffers right as we discussed in that chapter or uh, that slide and the, fan, the performance so at the end of the day what we can conclude about these circuits is that when you are looking at them not in isolation but as a chain then their performance is affected both by fan out why by fan out because fan out increases cl and also by the driving strength of the gate feeding its input that is the driving strength of the gate preceding it because that determines the rise and fall time of the input because at the input of all these inverters you have this gate capacitance and that is being charged by the previous stage right and that determines the rise and fall time so performance that is a delay is impacted both 
by the fan out which dictates the cl of this load state and also by its rise and fall time which is dictated by the driving capability of the previous stage so both of them affect this uh, you know delay and one of the generalized way or one of the approximate ways or empirical ways of finding out the delay is this tip of ith stage is simply the propagation delay for a step input which we have been finding out as 0.69 r equivalent cl plus what we do is we also add to it eta times eta is another empirical factor the i minus 1 step that is the propagation delay of the previous stage when it sees a step input we take a fraction of that add to the propagation delay of this, this stage with step input and then this gives us overall propagation delay in the presence of finite rise and fall times this eta is something which is adjusted to match the measurement results and typical values are 0.25 so what is the conclusion finite rise and fall times also impact the delay it also increases the delay so what should we do we should keep the rise times and fall times smaller than the propagation delay that will also help us so what this does this also helps us in you know reducing the short circuit leakage and also it helps us in reducing your uh, delay so that is what we should do as a design